hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the Associate Director of the Kevorkian Center. Welcome back to our Global Uprising Conference. Uh, to those of you who are tuning in on Zoom, a warm hello. Hopefully you were uh, with us in our earlier session. Uh, uh, if you weren't, welcome for the first time. Um, this is our first in-person event again, uh, you know, in over two years. And, um, you know, as uh, we heard in the last session, uh, it is, uh, Clock tomorrow uh, for a listening session uh, featuring uh, sound artists uh, Basil Abbas and uh, Ruan Abu Rahme in conversation with Ali Asabi and Fred Moten. Please join us for that. Please register on our website. Um, we also want to again thank uh, all of the uh, supporters and co-sponsors um, that we've had for this event. Uh, the Departments of History, Middle East and Islamic Studies, the IR program, uh, the Gallatin Human Rights uh, Initiative, the folks at DIA, of course, Tisch uh, Arts and Policy, um, and uh, the Social Cultural Analysis uh, Department. Um, so uh, how this panel is going to work, it's a little bit differently because we don't have an, a, a discussant position. Uh, we're uh, really um, fortunate to have four uh, you know, leading scholars to think through this question of uh, decolonization with. I'm going to provide very brief uh, introductions to each of them. They're each going to present, like in our previous panel, for 12 to 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to, at the, after that point, give them an opportunity to respond to some of the things each of them had said, and then open things up uh, to Q&A from the audience. If you're joining us on Zoom, please uh, paste questions in the chat. Um, we have an amazing mechanism that will allow me to see those and repeat them back to the audience or and to the speakers uh, when the time comes, but feel free to uh, drop that in there uh, at any time. So uh, without uh, any further ado, again, very, very brief uh, ingest <laughs> uh, 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 introductions. Uh, and I'll introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. Uh, we're joined by Arash Darai. Uh, he's an assistant professor at Whitman College. His scholarship addresses the intersections between political theory, Middle Eastern history, and racial politics, with a focus on the impact of social movements uh, and conceptions of historical change since the 1960s. Uh, following Arash, we'll have Miriam Haley Davis, uh, an, an alum of this institution. Welcome back, front of the program. Uh, and uh, she is an assistant professor of history at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, whose research focuses on development decolonization and race in North Africa. Uh, following Miriam, we have Nate George, uh, who is currently the uh, Raphael Morrison Dorman Memorial Postdoctoral Fellow at Harvard's Weatherhead <laughs> Center for International Affairs, uh, and uh, is going to be uh, joining the faculty of, uh, of political science at the School of Oriental, Oriental and African Studies uh, in London next year. Congratulations, Nate. Um, and uh, uh, last but certainly not least is Bikram Singh Gill, uh, an assistant professor of political science at Virginia Tech. Uh, and he is currently working on a book manuscript titled Race, Nature, and Accumulation, a decolonial political ecological analysis of land grabbing. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our four speakers, and then we're going to turn it over to Rush. Okay, um, I'm really grateful to Jim and to Nasser for inviting me and having me here. Um, the first panel was uh, like listening to a dream come true. I, I felt like I was taking notes rapidly and learning and saying, oh, everybody's saying a lot of the stuff I would want to say. So I hope when I repeat what was some of what was said, it's not too tedious for you. 
Um, what I'll try to do is to emphasize a slightly different perspective, perhaps with respect to some of the same questions. So I think I'm the only participant today who primarily works on the 1979 revolution in Iran. Um, and I think I'm also the only participant whose uh, disciplinary home for whatever that's worth is political theory, which means that I need to engage in certain kinds of debates to be legible, which obviously either consciously or unconsciously somehow shapes what I do. So I just wanna highlight those two things in terms of what it is that I'll be offering to the contribution and hopefully it's useful for the broader conversation. Um, so the broader question that I'm interested in is, uh, slightly simplified, but whether or not we can understand the 1979 revolution in Iran as world historical in the way that we might think about the French Revolution or the American Revolution for the purposes of understanding concepts in political theory. Increasingly, there's been a tendency to think about the Haitian Revolution on similar terms, perhaps for an older generation, the Russian Revolution, 1917 revolution. Um, uh, my question, at least within the field, is whether or not we can do the same thing with the 1979 revolution in Iran. And I became interested in this project as part of my dissertation research about a decade ago, um, when I actually started to notice similarities between the then emergent and starting Arab uprisings and the archival material that I was looking at with respect to mobilization in 1970s Iran. And so, um, first things first, I think that very, uh, you know, insinuation requires some caveats or qualifications because it goes against much of the consensus in Middle East studies scholarship, which is that there was an era of revolutionary politics and activity that ends in 1979. 1979 marks an ending point after which we enter into a new kind of historical period, which then fosters a new kind of revolutionary activity. And so if, if everybody talked about, some people talked about it directly, some indirectly, Asif Bayat's revolution without revolutionaries. Um, I, I'm talking about perhaps, I'm focused on some of the earlier chapters, the ones where he talks about Iran and uses Iran as the kind of um, contrasting point uh, from which he then thinks about contemporary uprisings from a different perspective. At the same time, uh, I'm interested in a series of debates that are prominent, uh, that are increasingly prominent within the field of political theory about how we think about colonization and decolonization, which actually map onto um, the Middle East studies scholarship and global, for better, for to use a broader kind of category or umbrella, how we think about the global 1970s. And so here in a fairly simplistic fashion, just to summarize, um, we can, people talk about a kind of revolutionary, global revolutionary period, um, specifically looking at uh, the Black Atlantic um, that extends from the 1930s until the 1970s, after which we've entered into a global counter-revolutionary period that is opposed to anti-colonial nationalism and the kinds of visions that it offers. Um, so, I'm trying to kind of situate Iran in, in terms of these two um, debates or these contexts and to think about um, how we might think about Iranian mobilization from this perspective. All right, so I'm gonna stop trying to act like I have everything memorized and I'm gonna start reading from the paper a little bit, uh, bear with me. So um, to offer an answer about whether or not we can think about the Iranian revolution as a source for thinking about revolution and decolonization today, given current circumstances, that's, that's the task I wanna kind of set myself up for here. Um, I wanna offer two provocations. And one of those provocations or the first of those provocations has to do with the historiography of revolution. So as the post-colonial revolution, um, 1979 in Iran is often equated with the Islamic revival in the Middle East, and hence it's understood to be part of a problem space that is somehow out of joint with our present. Um, the idea being that our present involves, uh, as others have noted, revolutionary politics that move beyond Islamism or at least try to reach beyond it. I'm interested in turning the inquiry around. Instead of taking 1979's Islamist identity for granted, as we try to understand events taking place today in real time, I wonder if we can actually start with events today and then revise the historiography of 1979 in Iran. Are there affinities between the types of revolutionary mobilization, 
And if so, can we actually understand 1979 as somehow continuous with our present? Um, so perhaps 1979 doesn't mark the end of a previous historical period, but rather the beginning of a new one in which we're currently still immersed. I think the one major exception in scholarship that uh, does start to think about these kinds of continuities is Behrouz Qamari Tabrizi's Foucault in Iran. Um, and what he does is uh, think about these continuities in terms of indeterminacy. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about that concept. Um, the idea goes as follows, and this is from his preface in case you haven't read the book, that there's, um, there tends to be this um, feeling uh, of a need for certainty whenever Islamism rears its head. And so he's looking at Egypt in 2013, and he's talking about how the feeling of a need for certainty, um, as opposed to being open to indeterminate possibilities, led to disastrous counter-revolutionary possibilities. Um, and that need for certainty often recalls or evokes the 1979 revolution in Iran. So what Ahmadi Tabrizi does is he goes back to the event and he tries to understand that event in terms of indeterminacy. He attempts to kind of cultivate a sensibility of indeterminacy in the reader with respect to that event, such that we might have a similar kind of ethic sensibility of indeterminacy with respect to Islamist movements um, in the present day. If we're thinking beyond Islamist secular, which he invites us to do, we might say that what he's attempting to do is, and this is not his words, these are my words, cultivate an ethic that would open us up to what Walter Benjamin calls a real state of emergency. Are we available to, open to being surprised by what we see instead of just employing existing conceptual categories as the previous panel was suggesting? So whether or not we agree with his line of reasoning and what he specifically says about 1979 or about Islamism, I think it's fair to say that we do live in times that value an orientation toward indeterminacy in general, to the political problem of the new. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm concerned with this orientation, which includes Amari Tabrizi. What leads us in academic scholarship and political thinking to value indeterminacy as a political value? When and how did this rise to contemporary prominence? What has been its history? One easy answer would be, uh, and this is now me kind of speaking to political theory in its conventional sense, would be that, um, since the 1970s and until very recently, the left has hit impasse after impasse, dead end after dead end, that has led many to look for entirely new and unscripted possibilities. And from this perspective, then we could say, well, the 1979 revolution in Iran was just yet another one of these dead ends, or perhaps one of the most prominent ones for the left. I think what Ramadi Tabrizi does in his book and trying to cultivate an ethic, an ethic that's open to indeterminacy is a, is a more honest and transparent answer to the disappointments that leftists have encountered, as opposed to engaging in a kind of disavowal where we try to tie it up and answer it and make it comprehensible. It's to say, okay, let's take a step back and actually rethink our categories, which I think is in the spirit of what this conference is attempting to do. But I think there's a bit more that we can do because I think part of what that project does is it arrives at an ethic of indeterminacy after the fact. At the same time, it calls for attention to lived experiences in the event. And so I'm wondering if we can see, identify an ethic of indeterminacy, not as it's articulated by Foucault who's observing events, but as it's perhaps articulated by Iranian thinkers themselves, Iranian revolutionaries themselves, and thereby to see if we can draw some kind of a continuity between revolutionary mobilization in 1970s Iran around an ethic of indeterminacy and more contemporary modes of uprising and activism in the region and perhaps broader. So, the question then for me becomes, how do we conceptualize a situated notion of indeterminacy? What is its situation? When I wrote my dissertation, I thought I had an answer to this question, and I now think it's the wrong answer. And so, or at least it's an incomplete answer. Um, it's gonna start to sound a lot like Asif Bayat in here. So <laughs> that answer was at the time, neoliberal rationality. 
that there's something significant about the fact that revolutionary resistance in Iran is emerging in parallel with at the same time as the emergence of neoliberal rationality as a counter-revolutionary project that is specifically opposed to state-centric attempts to bring about decolonization. And let's not forget, it's a, it's a forgotten history, but the, the Shah of Iran was actually quite involved in the, in the passage of the new international economic order, um, played a real important broker kind of role in those conversations. Um, and was really positioning himself as being a state leader in the project for decolonization, which required first social and economic rights, the realization of social and economic rights before individual human rights. So from that perspective, an individual human rights agenda can actually match up really nicely with an anti-colonial, anti-imperial agenda that's opposed to the Shah's position with respect to the United States, and thereby um, also parallel itself, if you will, with neoliberal rationality, if we see that as being facilitated by human rights discourse. All right, there's an obvious problem with this, which is false consciousness. And so um, I've since tried to distance myself from that way of thinking and to actually see if I can reconceptualize um, the project as perhaps involving the revolutionary project in 1970s Iran as perhaps involving some such overlaps but not necessarily being reduced to them. Also involving a broader ethic of indeterminacy as a possibility for revolutionary politics, which could then be instructive for the present. So this brings me to my second provocation, which uh, pertains to the theme of this panel, which is decolonization. So how did Iranian revolutionaries think about decolonization hand in hand with um, engaging in activities that cultivated an ethic of indeterminacy and or and we'll bracket this part, um, might have paralleled an emergent counter-revolutionary politics globally. So um, now I have to address two other points of skepticism, which is that most of the time when people think about or theorize colonization, Iran is not the first country that comes to mind. Uh, and that is for, I think, at least two reasons. Um, one of them is that um, Iran was never formally colonized. So it was, it had a semi-colonial condition. And I think the parallel case here, which has been really interesting for me as I've been collaborating with Eleni Santin Zalaka um, is Ethiopia, which also was generally experiencing a semi-colonial um, condition. Um, I'll offer this as a thought or for conversation, which is that um, the semi-colonial condition in Iran perhaps resembles some of the ways in which we deal with coloniality today, which is there isn't direct formal colonial rule, and yet the structuring antagonisms of colonialism still endure, and they still shape politics on the ground. Um, so perhaps there are lessons to be drawn from Iran, Ethiopia, insofar as thinkers were engaged in understanding, interpreting, conceptualizing colonization and anti-colonization in a moment at the heights of decolonization, but doing so from this perspective. I'm also critical, however, of um, arguments that say that Iranian visions of decolonization are out of joint with present times because the visions that they offered were specifically about cultural decolonization, which is code for Islamic revival. And um, here's how I would uh, respond to that. And this will be my final kind of comment, um, which is that, uh, that way of analysis looks primarily at what different thinkers said. And so it looks at ideas as um, fact or content, if you will, and doesn't pay attention to the form of the ideas, how the ideas were embodied, how they were enacted, performed. And I'm thinking here of Zahra, your comments in the, in the previous panel about um, the materiality of ideas in this case. And so I'll just offer some very brief kinds of remarks of an article that I published, which I think got me the invite to this amazing session from Nasser, um, which talks about Ali Shariati, who is the, the kind of ideologue, if you will, of, um, uh, of the revolution in Iran is understood as being the Islamic ideologue par excellence. So um, if you look on the surface, Shariati um, offers, says he's writing an Islamic ideology, 
Um, Shariati also has a text in 1969 that everybody cites in order to say that an Islamic revolutionary politics will lead to an authoritarian Islamic state. And that, uh, that is a set of lectures uh, called Omat va Imamat, which he delivered in 1969. Um, so first of all, people are reading it as text and not thinking about it as lectures. What the lectures do is that they basically translate Sukarno's notion of guided democracy into a Shia register, which is the idea that a revolution does not end simply with state capture, but rather involves um, the continued training of the people until they become ready to exercise democracy. Because if we just implement democracy now, people aren't trained enough, so they're gonna be misguided and they're gonna vote us out of power and all the gains of decolonization will be lost. This is Sukarno, 1960s. So Shariati gives a similar version of this, but instead it's Imam Ali as the ultimate revolutionary leader who continues to train people after the fact, which obviously is setting the stage for Khomeini to come in with the platonic notion of, you know, Velayat Fari to be a jurist consulate who will train people to be able to maintain the revolution um, through a certain kind of ethic. I think that um, I read Shariati as, um, saying one thing and actually doing something else. Um, so notice how this model involves a pedagogical function, an educational function. So people need to be taught and trained. If we look at the lecture itself, what we see is Shariati um, doing something that uh, recalls a trope that's common in canonical Western political theory that is associated with a figure by the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, which is that he invents a character. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau famously in the social contract talks about a paradox of founding. It's called a paradox of founding where a general will establishes a political community, but in order for a general will to emerge, to establish a political community, people need to be trained such that they can correctly exercise the general will. And so now you're in a paradox. When, who starts the training when? Don't you need a political community first to train people? So then Rousseau invents the character or figure of the lawgiver. And the lawgiver is a foreigner who emerges into a community. It's like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Lands all of a sudden, solves all of the problems, has no investment in the community, and leaves. Um, and people kind of cite this to say in the most creative iterations to say that all of paradoxes, all of politics is shaped by paradox. And we should actually see paradox everywhere, i.e. indeterminacy. And by seeing it everywhere, we actually cultivate a democratic sensibility. Chariati in these particular lectures at key moments cites an invented figure by the name of Chandel. Chandel appears to be some kind of French francophone orientalist expert um, and here's Shariati saying that we need epistemological decolonization, right? The epistemological kind of critique that we think is associated with the Islamic revival. Um, he, we need this, and yet he's citing a French figure in order to convince the audience that he has authority and that you should believe him that we need this. So what's going on? I think what Shariati is doing in the text is actually setting up um, mistakes, errors that he wants the audience to catch. He's performing a noble lie to draw on a platonic language in order for the audience to cultivate, to develop their own ability to think critically, right? He wants to actually cultivate um, epistemological self-determination in the audience, as opposed to tell it to them at the level of substance. And he's doing this notably before state capture. He's doing this using the language of the Pahlavi state, who's speaking about anti-colonialism and so forth, um, and doing it 10 years before the revolution without any you know, promise that the revolution would happen. Shariati dies before the revolution ever happens. So um, I suppose my question for the conference then is, what do we do with this? If you have the thinker of the Islamic revival as far as Iran is concerned, and if Iran becomes the signifier of Islamic revival across the region, and you have the thinker actually cultivating an ethic, an attitude, an orientation toward indeterminacy and paradox, which is the stuff of democracy, which goes against the notion that we just need to hold on to the state uh, at all costs in order to hold on to decolonization. Um, 
What does that mean for how we understand Iran in relation to the rest of the region? What does that mean for how we understand the 1979 revolution in relation to the rest of the region? What does that mean for how we understand the relationship between secularism and the Islamic revival when we're thinking about more contemporary uprisings? So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Hi, it's wonderful to be back. Um, it feels like a homecoming and it's uh, thank you to Jim and Nasser for the invitation and all the work that's gone into bringing us here. Um, I'm a bit jumbled because so much has happened in the short time we've been in this room that I'm scrapping some of my comments. And I always love being in conversation with Arash and thinking also about 1962 and the Algerian revolution as one of these, and we've talked about this in the pre-COVID times as one of these world historical revolutions with a question mark at the end. And in the past few years, I've been increasingly troubled by this question. Well, I've been increasingly troubled by a lot of things in the past few years, but um, this question as well, in that Algeria is odd, it's both the paradigmatic site of anti-colonial struggle and decolonization, and um, an open question about decolonization and did it happen? And those that, that line of flight has become more and more intense in the wake of the Hirak, uh, the 2019, I will venture to say revolution, if you're thinking about language and politics and solidarity, um, which brings us also to a question from the last panel about resurrecting revolution and what are the politics of naming and resurrecting um, these, these uprisings? Um, and so, you know, of course, this question of de did decolonization happen is a non sequitur uh, in that um, it depends who you're speaking to. And of course, it would be politically irresponsible to say, no, there was no decolonization and an incredible insult to the Algerian revolution. At the same time, the notion of a imperfect, perhaps, decolonization has been one that's been important to protesters and activists on the streets. So this is something I've been wrestling with. Um, in addition to Algeria, both as a historical paradigm and as a place of theory making. And I've been wrestling with this increasingly as the historical event of decolonization and calls for decoloniality as an epistemological model seem to be getting conflated. So the last few years alone on my Zoom with my cat, I've been, um, I've been thinking about these things. And you know, how do we understand the relationship between a kind of coloniality, as Arash, you indicated, and decolonization. And so my comments, I think, will also have to come back around to that, including the question of Fanon in all of this, which for me is, is, is primordial. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully, I think this will be not just a rehashing of Fanon's thought, but a kind of provocation. I haven't even started my prepared remarks yet, so we're all in a lot of trouble. Um, so one of the things I appreciated about the invitation today was the tension between decolon decolonization as an agenda of total disorder on the one hand and the promise of a futurity on the other hand. And I was thinking about this notion of total disorder and thinking about Fadi's comments, also the specter of civil war, which is always present in the Algerian case and certainly has been in the Hirak in thinking about the kinds of political mobilizations and um, confrontations with the state that were seen as politically viable. And in the Algerian case as well, the past modes of anti-colonial revolt have been um, conjured in the present. And here is where I'm perhaps reluctant to do away with revolution with a capital R in that I do think even if utopia is a hard word to say right now um, that you know I, I'm not comfortable with totally defanging the aspirations of third worldism as they pop up and structure political imaginaries and so perhaps that's something we could also talk about going forward um, and you know to go back to this question and you know I'm at UC Santa Cruz and so we have our kind of own theoretical debates on the west coast but <laughs> Sometimes I, I say that there's a kind of UC theory world that I'm part of, but part of that has been very much about this delinking, about Mignolo's concept of decoloniality and what we're supposed to do with this as scholars of the Middle East and North Africa. And since I'm on home, home turf here, I thought I would um, venture to say a few things. 
and that's both that the call to recenter local or indigenous epistemologies that goes along with decolonization is of course very politically important, but it's also very problematic in the Middle East and North Africa, and that I don't think we have a clear understanding, at least in North Africa or in Algeria, I think it's um, an open question about who is the indigenous. Um, and if we're thinking about co-optations of revolutions and thinking about ecological crises, I'm reminded of when um, the, when there were fires in Algeria, I think it was just last summer, although my own sense of time is a bit warped, um, you know, the state used this uh, both to, you know, rehash a question of Berberism that was seen as a threat to, uh, to state sovereignty, um, as well as, um, you know, to reassert a kind of statist model of revolution. And, you know, Taboon at one point says the Hirak is over and it was a good thing. So in terms of the state's ability to use revolution as counter-revolution, I think that that's a really clear example. Um, so, you know, in, in thinking about decolonization and decoloniality or de-Westernization, um, you know, today's call also asked us to reflect on the continued role of progressive stagism and universalism. And this was something that came up in the last panel about what do we do if we no longer have a kind of history with a capital H, or teleologies that we can invest in in some capacity, where does that leave us politically? Um, and certainly the realm of the authentic, and you know, Fadi's work has been really important, I think for many of us thinking about this, the realm of the authentic uh, can get taken up in problematic ways that then does this boundary work among um, political actors and who the real left is or who, who the real revolutionary is. Um, and so, you know, to, to try to, I think, rehash some kind of Muslim or Arab authenticity in the wake of a decolonial injunction can also get us into trouble politically. Um, so, you know, this is a, another question about um, the horizon for revolutionary thought and where that takes us. Um, I think, as I mentioned, for me and in conversation with Shariati has been Franz Fanon and his legacy. So perhaps I'll just take a second to think about a project that I've been working on that has not, I haven't written anything on this, but I've been reading Algerian intellectual writings about Fanon after 1962. Um, and I'll say about my own work, uh, which perhaps goes against the grain of some of the current discussions, my own work where I deal with post-62 is also a story about continuities. And it's a story about a kind of gr economic grammar that the Algerian state picks up from the colonial regime. Um, and, you know, Fanon's work has been central to I'm sure everybody in this room thinking about the left, thinking about revolution, thinking about what anti-colonial struggle can look like, and perhaps also in more recent years, reintroducing a kind of binary and political clarity when, you know, in the kind of sea of notions of colonial encounters and contact and hybridity, right? I think Fanon gave us in a way into that discussion to say that, you know, the binary does matter um, and, can, and structures political and economic realities. But what interests me is actually the fact that Algerian intellectuals themselves engaged in decolonization as a real-time project had critiques of Fanon, which is of course not to say that um, Fanon's work hasn't been incredibly important, but I think his, their critiques tell us something about how um, we want to read Fanon as a theorist of the Algerian revolution or something akin to that, and the real-time unfolding of struggle as it was happening in Algeria in the 1960s. Um, I've also forgot to set my stopwatch, so please just let me know if I'm going on too long. But a number of thinkers point out that French frameworks and epistemologies are central to Fanon's thinking. That this is not to say that Fanon was, a, was somehow, you know, not an original thinker. I'm in no way putting, you know, advocating uh, the importance of his work, but just to say that there is, um, also a French genealogy for his thought that I think is undeniable. And for many Algerian intellectuals, well, I won't say many, three or four that I've been reading who are writing both in French and in Arabic, um, they point out that, you know, Fanon didn't speak Arabic. For him, Islam played a very marginal role. And, you know, his letters with Shariati get at this. 
the people I've interviewed who knew Fanon said, yes, you know, he in many ways was a kind of universalist, secular French revolutionary. Um, and in that ways, I think mirrors the blind spot of the French left. Um, and I have a chapter in my book about the kind of Pierre Rouge or these, you know, people like Pablo from the Fourth International who come to Algeria and are, you know, in cahoots with Ben Bella and pen major acts of land reform. Um, and, and all they are trying to say is to in no way take away from the brilliance of Fanon and his radical and heroic engagement, but to say that he came from a certain milieu and perhaps had some blind spots as well. Um, in one of the letters, uh, this is Maspero is, is publishing a kind of edited collection of his works and writes to Reda Malik at one point and says, you know, I'm going through Al Mujahid, the FLN's journal, um, which articles are by Fanon? Because of course the articles aren't penned, they are just articles in Al Mujahid. And Reda Malik sends this kind of devastating response saying, that's not how we worked, right? This was not, we were all thinking about these things together. And um, you know, please keep in mind that the revolution taught Fanon something just as Fanon taught us a lot. Um, and so thinking about theory and practice, this line of, um, you know, of um, a comrade, a comrade or a comrade type of solidarity, but also critique strikes me as important to kind of revisit. Um, so, I, you know, I guess I'm going to wrap up um, how, how much time? a couple minutes um, by thinking also about the myth, the, the mythologies of revolution that have been inherited from 1962, which are both fundamental for the Hirak, even as they're being challenged by the Hirak. And that's something I've been grappling with in my writings for the last year or so. And it also comes from the end of some of these meta narratives that we were grappling with earlier this afternoon, including, and this is something I write about in the book, including kind of pan-Arab visions of Algeria or the Algerian struggle. Um, and one of the, you know, the, what became one of the slogans of the Hirak was um, actually a kind of confrontation between a journalist speaking in Fosha to a young man on the street who refuses to speak in Fosha back. And, you know, and he, and he ends up saying, yes, no, God, they all must go. But it's precisely in this moment where she's saying, you know, speak Arabic, speak Arabic. And he says, you know, he's saying kind of like, listen, you're on the streets of Algiers here. Who are you to be telling me what kind of Arabic to speak? Um, and so I'll just wrap up by saying, I, I guess maybe I'm making a plea um, both to think along the lines of earlier, but also for the continued importance of certain third world structures and vocabularies. Um, and I think what we can see is a tension between these kind of linear temporalities of the state, notions of status sovereignty. Um, you know, there has been images that are, you know, really about kind of oil and, and blood of the martyrs as state resources um, that need to be honored by a responsible government. That's a, you know, that's a very kind of legible symbol on the one hand, but also this kind of return to a redemptive time of revolution or a cyclical time that's embedded in a longer history of uprisings with all their different vocabularies in the country, you know, going back to Abdel Qadir or, you know, other, other 19th century revolts. And so I guess I'm struggling in thinking about decolonization, about what to do with this kind of linear time that still seems to structure imaginaries um, that is also this homogeneous empty time of modernity um, and, and where what we can think about through decolonization in that regards, but also the, I think, uncomfortable at times pairing between decolonization and decoloniality as a theoretical framework that we are being confronted with and, and working through. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd first like to thank the Kevorkian Center for the kind invitation to join, in particular Nasser, James, and Vitandi for handling the logistics and accommodating my revised plans, which comes with a disclaimer. I will preface that what I'm about to say today comes after a series of sleepless nights caring for a very sick toddler, so please bear with me. Um, I'll begin by responding to one of the prompts of the panel, which was what otherwise sideline questions and forms should decolonization open up in a revolutionary perspective. 
And I think what I'm about to say will address many of the themes that we've been already discussing today. Uh, and I think a renewed focus on the question of the political community could be very productive to think about in terms of decolonization. Who is in, how is power structured and who rules? And how does this community fit into the world? There's a, really often not a lot of attention in the radical revolutionary historiography of the Arab world, especially history and theory shaped by Marxism to, the, to political institutions and forms. Capitalist imperialism has of course been tackled in terms of political economic exploitation and colonial gov governmentalities and socialist alternatives and, and throughout the 20th century have focused on dependency uh, delinking. But I think what we ought to think about as well in our region, what makes political organization and institutional institutions anti-colonial. So I'll talk a bit here about my research, which is on the history of the international civil war in Lebanon between the late 1960s through the end of the Cold War. And using that to think about what it means to think about what decolonization means. It's usually not thought of it in this such a framework. But first to return to our present moment, and I think this came up in the first panel on revolution especially, but I'll, it's kind of implicit, I'll say it explicitly. Over the past 11 years of uprisings and revolutions and wars in the Arab world, I think we can see that there's been a practical bifurcation or decoupling of anti-authoritarian demands and anti-colonial demands and political alliances and networks. Because after decades of political, educational, civic repression in the Arab republics, the anti-colonial Arab republics, which are also paternalistic military regimes, they have for many made a mockery of the 20th century anti-colonial tradition. This anti-colonial tradition is most often associated with Arab nationalism, but of course is not limited to it. It was also shaped by socialism, communism, Marxism, feminism, and third worldism, and all their many varieties. These all influenced anti-colonialism in the region. And all these together may be thought of encompassing the Arab left, which has seen a revival in scholarship these days. Um, what united all these formations, I think, was their oppos common opposition and programs against Zionism, imperialism, and Arab reaction, which was, of course, a famous slogan at the time. And Islamism, uh, the Islamic revival, as uh, Arash talked about, emerged in reaction to these trends and articulated another really competing anti-colonial agenda. But we're not, I'm not going to talk much about that, but I'm looking forward to discussing that point um, as we move on. So how do we get here? Why has author anti-authoritarian, in our present moment, whatever is left of the Arab left has bifurcated between these camps, the anti-authoritarian and the anti-colonial camp. And as our first panel also highlighted, the principal example here is the question of Syria, the most politically divisive and contested site of struggle. One of these camps disgusted with the regime's obnoxious rhetoric of resistance while living in the, is disgust, dis disgusted with this rhetoric of resistance while living in a brutal and stifling dictatorship has seemingly broken with the idea of anti-colonialism as a discursive ground of the regime that they impose. The other camp intoxicated with the Syrian regime's meager, yet at the same time very real support of anti-Zionist struggle has sacrificed democratic reform on the altar of geopolitical interests. Is a progressive synthesis possible? What role might history play in today's political conjuncture. I think we can look back at a rich, if embattled and later marginalized revolutionary tradition of anti-colonial popular sovereignty in the region that might provide some inspiration here. From the contemporary context, sometimes activists and scholars have begun to re revisit the history of the 20th century and they analyze it in, ter in the terms of today's conjuncture. This often can result in 
the changing of emancipatory, what were emancipatory mass movements are changed into a story of perversion in the sense that they called for freedom from alien domination, but have built indigenous domination instead in their place. And therefore we should discard them. I think there's definitely truth in this broad outlines of this such a story, but it is after all lackluster history. We have to rewrite the history of 20th century, century anti-colonialism in the region. The twists and the turns of the story are important as is the agency of specific individuals, groups, and classes. Revolutionary groups and their aims, I don't think should be merely taken at the face value. They should be con considered in the context that they were operating on the local, regional, and international levels. And as we begun, have, have begun to uh, talk about today, as I'm, I'm very happy to hear a lot about counter-revolution because revolution must be studied alongside its opposite counter-revolution because the options for revolution are majorly conditioned by the forces that are arrayed against it and vice versa. It's not simply enough to look at the history of failed movements and generations and say that they had gotten their demands wrong or their agendas were right or they were insufficiently X, Y, or Z. We have to measure them against the other competing forces and agendas of the time, not simply abstract ideals. So I want to highlight today the case of the Lebanese national movement, which my dissertation and book project um, begins to deal with. When my specific remarks will be drawn from my forthcoming article on their campaign, the national movement's campaign to abolish the sectarian political regime in Lebanon in the 1975-76 civil war and the period immediately preceding it. The article understands the struggle for the Lebanese state as far more than an internal sectarian conflict, rather as an important setting in an international civil war over the direction of decolonization and the shape of political representation in the Eastern Mediterranean. I consider it in the, the war in Lebanon an international war over the colonial, an international war over the colonial question for a couple of reasons. First, because the Lebanese state, like all the other states in the region, was not shaped by the self-determination of its inhabitants, but the forces of imperialism after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. And as well, because the forces contending for the control of the state were pr principally divided on the colonial question. They divided into two coalitions between the supporters of the colonially set conditioned sectarian regime, which also called for and worked these parties and forces called for and worked closely with Western and particularly US imperialism, as well as settler colonial Israel. And they were self-consciously adopted counter-revolutionary discourses and, be, and were proponents of imperial sovereignty over popular sovereignty. This, these were arrayed against the partisans of abolishing the sectarian regime and reorienting the state towards anti-colonial networks and support for particularly this Palestinian struggle. These were self-consciously revolutionary forces and partisans of anti-colonial popular sovereignty. So this coalition was called the Lebanese National Movement. For those that don't know, it was a front coalition of political parties, movements, and independent figures representing an ideologically diverse and multi-sectarian constituency and it was really led by the core parties of the left, which were the Progressive Socialist Party, the Lebanese Communist Party, and the Organization of Communist Action. They really were the ideological um, leading forces of this coalition, the socialist left, in other words. Other significant players certainly existed. We can go into that later. And these did include parties which had solid sectarian bases like the Progressive Socialists and the Murabutun, but they were also committed to the secularizing call to abolish political sectarianism. And these people, the national movement fought hand in hand with the Palestinian revolution in direct battle against set settler colonialism. So my project has an aim to recover the buried history of this movement, which I think has been silenced 
by many interested parties coming from a number of angles. Its defeat, the defeat of this coalition from near victory in 1976 did much for many to recast its demise as a foregone conclusion by participants in the movement and inaugurating a tradition of debilitating auto critiques and lacrimose narratives. Others hostile to the principles of the movement in general, the anti-sectarian and tricontinentalist tri project have simply consigned it to oblivion. Many of the participants of Lebanon's 2019 um, uprising have also failed to articulate a historical connection with the national movement, despite raising many of its demands. Interesting that there's so much overlap there, and yet the historical memory is not really called upon. Both secular scholars, likewise, who stress the allegedly Western and imperial nature of secularism, have also ignored this episode of explicitly Arab, secular, anti-colonial, and multi-sectarian mass mobilization. And usually, so usually Lebanon and its civil war is considered the epitome of social fragmentation, which of course is a very valid um, point, but what we, what we miss by, by looking at Lebanon and the struggle for it in this time is that actually a high point of socially integrative activism. There was a corner that was termed after the defeat of the movement that changed the ground after it. The high crest of the history came in August 1975 in the early months of the generalized civil violence that began earlier that year when the national movement issued its quote, transitional program for the democratic reform of the political system in Lebanon, which I'll just quickly summarize, called to abolish sectarian power sharing in Lebanon, institute strictly equal parliamentary representation of all citizens, implement publicly funded elections, a voluntary personal civil status law, independent judiciary capable of trying government uh, officials. It, it called for um, the establishment of a second representative institution, the base, a, essentially a, civil, a citizen's assembly called the Basic Lebanese Activities Council, which would allow for a much wider political representation by involving delegates of uh, professional, economic, social, cultural, religious, and corporate bodies to be represented within the system, which was designed, this idea was designed to address social and economic issues while also easing the anxiety of abolishing political sectarianism by allowing religious institutions to be represented. And importantly, it did not ne neglect the international sphere, calling for Lebanon's unambiguous participation and support of Palestinian Arab national liberation movements. In this sense, it was a fundamental revolt against a revolt against the colonial and the post-colonial state system. Far from an abstract theoretical treatise drawn up by intellectuals, the transitional program was, act, was also a public declaration aimed, designed to arm the rising and growing popular movement with immediate and clear objectives amid the shifting terrain of an international civil war. It built on at least a decade of popular struggles for improved working and living conditions, the organization of non-sectarian political parties and unions, the right to resist Zionist settler colonialism, as well as imperial dependency. And despite its modest title calling for reform, the character and the quality of the demands foretold a qualitative change in regime from, from sectarian to popular sovereignty a point that was not lost on its local, regional, and international adversaries who could brook no compromise on the maintenance of political sectarianism. In fact, uh, the national movement had advocated for these reforms, the abolition of political sectarianism and equal representation, which was deliberated in the official National Dialogue Committee of 1975, which adopted these positions and then was scuttled in a counter-revolutionary offensive, which we can talk about later. And eventually, and in the, the in armed intervention of, or of the Syrian Assadist military um, in 1976 that crushed the control of, uh, that the 
national movement and the PLO had established over that, the majority of the country and the population. But this preservation uh, of the sectarian regime in 1976 with only moder minor modifications to the existing arrangement did not actually reflect the balance of forces in Lebanon and neither was it inevitable due to an allegedly sectarian social fabric. Rather, the US orchestrated defeat and decapitation of the national movement was a contingent outcome principally achieved through the massive inter intervention of the Syrian military with Israeli assent. And if Assad intended to bring his police action as bringing order to chaos, thus justifying a role for him in the international negotiations over Palestine, his bold move actually manifested the state of colonial power in the Mushrik. To conclude this very general brief um, historical overview in which I tried to bring back the question of political aims and ideology into the study of revolution and decolonization. Uh, I think we have an instructive history of Arab internationalism, an evocative history of an attempt led by socialists across social difference of sect, class, region, and nation to fashion amidst crisis, a just political community. One whose demands resonate with today's challenges posed by both imperialism and authoritarianism, and one that escapes the trap of ascribing perceived failure to inescapable self-inflicted wounds. Thank you. Stopwatch. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, James, Nasser, uh, Vitandi, everybody for organizing this wonderful conversation and for inviting me to participate. Um, I think like Miriam, I've been listening to everything and um, it's kind of put us so much into my head that I'm uh, struggling to, to come back to what I had kind of prepared and planned to speak about. Um, I think like Arash, I, I'm actually more probably out of place than you as the, I, I would like to think of myself as a political theorist as well, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you that if, if that's important. But I definitely, I think definitely I'm not a Middle Eastern, uh, uh, I'm not a regional specialist. Uh, I think I'm probably the only one here uh, in that way. Um, and I think um, I definitely am maybe of that, that section of the left that has been subject to critique today. Uh, so I think maybe this is an opportunity for a good good debate and <laughs> set of discussions uh, that have been, you know, brewing for the last 10 years or so. But um, in, in my view, US imperialism does remain the primary contradiction uh, in thinking about discussions of decolonization today, right? Um, I think empirically, a discussion of the last 10 years that doesn't take an empirical account of Libya or the fact that Syria is one third under US occupation at the moment, one third of Syria, and the question of sanctions, who is sanctioned and who is not sanctioned across the global south, not just in the Middle East. These are pressing questions for uh, either the restoration of colonization, not in a methodological nationalist sense, but colonization as a world system that is integral to the reproduction of capitalism, right? Um, and the reason why this matters is if we take a basic, and also I am an old meta-narrative Marxist-Leninist from the 1970s. I mean, I will say guilty as charged. I've, I've tried to get past it and I can't. Um, but to start with, uh, to start from that framework is to look out at a world that is polarized still, right? Where is wealth held, right? Where, where does finance capital park, right? What, wh where is, when you look at the division of the world between levels of consumption. Um, Zara was talking about the Anthropocene. We look at the ecological consequences, who bears those costs, who benefits, those are clearly divided still, right? The material legacy of colonization continues today. If that's the case, how do we explain it? If we go to a methodological nationalist register that refuses the global, if we talk about global uprising, what about global power, right? Are sanctions simply neutral uh, not worthy of analytical discussion, right? Um, or are they themselves compelled by these structural foundations that have produced this world of unevenness and ecological exhaustion, right? 
And that doesn't mean that when we critique sanctions or we, that one is making a claim, a binary claim, right? Uh, a value judgment that one is, there's a space of innocence and goodness that is subject to sanctions and the opposite, but uh, that, the, that the sanctions themselves are driven by, right? Again, this colonial structure, that it is pressing that it is overturned, right? That's decolonization, okay? The overturning of the structure of colonialism, okay? So I want to begin, um, okay, I, I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna try to get back to what I, what I had planned on speaking about. So I'll, I'll come back to kind of maybe my response to some of what has been said. But what I want to do is I want to think about what is decolonization as a structural question, right? But that requires us to answer what is colonization as a structure. And for me, this requires thinking about it in relation to capitalism, right? But here is where I do part ways with Western Marxists in the sense that the relations of production in capitalism are not only capital labor, right? The relations of production on capitalism as a world system is the denial of sovereignty, right? To um, states or peoples across the colonized world, right? That fundamental, that was, that's the relation of production. So what Lenin calls a national question is a relation of production question. Right? So if revolution in the Marxist tradition is the overturning of the relations of production, this is not just capital labor, right? It's this question also of overturning the denial of sovereignty premise of the entire system, right? Um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's one point I think I just wanted to make uh, out at the beginning. And what I will uh, uh, also say at, at the beginning is that this structure, right? The, the sovereignty question, okay? the relation of production question as it relates to colonialism is the fundamental question of our times, not just in relation to social, global social inequality, but also to the ecological question. There's no way that the climate crisis, that the ecological crisis can be addressed without addressing the colonial structure, right? Without, without actual real decolonization being set in motion. Okay, so why is that the case? So what, what do I mean by the colonial structure? Okay, so here, um, most of my talk is going to be quite theoretical. Again, apologies to Rush, but it's going to be it's going to be uh, quite theoretical with some with some historical uh, elements to it. But um, sort of in thinking through the structure of colonization as the world system, right? I, I go back to the long 16th century. Okay, going to and and this is in many ways uh, again a very historical materialist methodological approach because Marxists will often go to these say moments of primitive accumulation and enclosures in Europe as the ground upon which capitalism emerges, right? So I go to the 16th century, uh, the, the, the opening of the uh, Americas, right? Through Spanish conquest, okay? As the moment in which this idea of who can and can't be sovereign is first articulated, right? And, and, what, and what are the relations through which this, uh, this distinction is articulated? It is when the Spanish colonizers and other European colonizers encounter indigenous worlds, right? And they encounter in, in, in a paper, I think that Nasser would have maybe read, maybe one reason I was invited, the concept that I, I work with is this idea of an earth world, right? They encounter, again, not just spaces of nature, right? They don't just encounter spaces that are lying passive and given, but that have been co-produced in time and space by indigenous peoples of these lands, right? And so, and in fact, the survival, as we know, the survival of colonizers was always contingent upon the worlds that were in existence um, in these lands, right? So the, and here I'll, I'm gonna take a, a quick kind of sidestep to Fanon here, actually. Uh, so Fanon distinguishes between the idea of a gift and the idea of conquest, right? So at this moment of encounter, there's a gift that the Europeans are encountering, right? A gift of the Taino to Columbus, Right, a gift that the Cortez encounters in Mexico, which is where their survival is contingent upon the social, ecological, material uh, civilization and societies that are able to provision food, that are able to provision materials that allow for survival in these lands. Right, but the colonial moment is a refusal of the gift, a refusal of the reciprocation of the gift. Right, it is a move to conquest. Right, uh, uh, Fanon talks about the movement from gift to movement of conquest. Right? And in that movement from gift to conquest, okay, uh, that earth world is reconceived as a space of nature. Okay, so it is, it is rendered terra nullius, it is rendered virgin, right? Not, not, not co-produced, but simply given, 
Indigenous peoples are reproduced through racialized technologies as primitive peoples who are wasting these lands, right? And so real sovereignty lies with the Spanish, with the Europeans, who can put this land to use, this nature now, okay? So I just want to say as a, as a quick point that this is well, how this links to the ecological crisis for me is that this transformation of indigenous earth world into nature denies its reproductive, um, uh, let's say it's reproductive conditions, right? So there's a using up of these lands, right? Without a reproduction of the, of the practices and the knowledge that went into making those lands in the first place, right? But this is an immense, immense form of primitive accumulation. Uh, 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 it opens up through the, this creation of a category of nature and acting on this nature, a denial of sovereignty, right? A denial of sovereign, say, control over resources. It opens up these lands to pillaging and a drain, what the Utsapanayak and Prabhapanayak call a drain of surplus, right? Surplus is drained from periphery to core on an unprecedented scale, right? And this, um, this provisions the grounds upon which capitalism emerges um, in Europe, right? So the drain of surplus from colony to core, from periphery to core is fundamental uh, to the emergence of modern capitalist development in Europe and its reproduction, right? So again, what is this surplus? It's a surplus where you don't have to pay the reproductive cost. You can use up the labor, whether it's enslaved labor, right? Whether it's captive labor, uh, whether it's resources reconfigured as land, you can use them up without having to reproduce them. And then, so th these resources underpin the European miracle and the European takeoff, right? So what, I, what I'm suggesting is that logic continues to persist today, right? That, uh, this is what Kwame Nkrumah talks about in the mid 20th century. Whatever we do, the Europeans are going to come back because they need our resources, they need our land. They need sovereign, they need what Samir Amin calls first uh, exclusive access to the resources of the world, right? And the denial of sovereignty is paramount to that dynamic, right? This is the core periphery dynamic and so forth. So when decolonization occurs, right, it's, it's occurring on this, this structural level, right? This sovereign reclamation over resources, right? But which is a question of violence, right? It's a question, this is where Fanon comes in, if the land was taken away and at the base, right, it's about establishing sovereign control uh, through violent usurpation, then to, re to, to, re to remake that encounter space is to again, respond to colonial violence with anti-colonial violence. That right? is to not beg or ask for sovereign recognition, is to demand and command sovereign recognition. And this is the, this is where the violence question was really significant for the decolonization movements, right? And, but what does violence really mean, right? Violence means being able, and it doesn't mean necessarily being violent, but having the means, again, again the, to establish a material equation that the colonizer must respect, right? Now, what's the challenge that decolonization confronts though? And this is, Fanon is very clear about this in the chapter on violence, right? And it's in the last 10 pages on the chapter of violence that at the moment of independence, right, where now the objective is to overcome this pol polarization of a world of poverty, of a world in which many are immiserated and in a world in which wealth is concentrated. So to overcome this, the colonized, the formerly colonized must develop, right, uh, their industries. They must develop the uh, economic base from which they can provide material goods, but also from which they can sufficiently confront the power of the colonizer who will become the neo-colonial force, right? So the development of the productive forces uh, of the newly independent nation. But the challenge here becomes the capital that was developed during colonization flees at the moment of decolonization. It flees to the core, right? So now you're left with no capital. You're left with no resources to develop your country. So what do you do then, right? And this is where Fanon then comes to the question of reparations as being pivotal and being really key but reparations are not coming, right? So then this becomes a bind for third world states. And this is where the question is not easy of what to do. And, 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 and I'll jump back a little bit right now to the Haitian revolution, right? The, the first kind of great decolonial revolution, what's the, what's the challenge that Haiti confronts immediately, right? It confronts being surrounded by the gunboats of France and the United States. So even as much as Haiti wanted um, a, a, a vision of the Haitian Revolution was African agricultural, small-scale agriculture, 
the Haitians restart the plantation, right? Post-independence, they restart the plantation to be able to generate foreign exchange to uh, access weapons and industrial means with which they can fight the French and the Americans, right? That model, I would argue, is a key question that confronts third world states across the 20th century, right? How do you develop the material power in a case where capital, we hear about white flight, when capital flight occurs, when there's a capital strike, okay? How do you rapidly industrialize? Right? These are questions of hard material power, right? Without which we see, as Kwame Nkrumah says, colonialism will return. Neo-colonialism will return. It's a structural question of the system in which we reproduce ourselves here in the United States, right? Uh, there is inequality here, but it's stabilized through a global inequality. It's stabilized through the denial of sovereignty elsewhere that allows for a drain of surplus from periphery uh, to core, right? And the states, th this is the key point that I wanna make. The states across the 20th century, and this point, sorry, has been recently further furthered in Vincent Bevan's recent book, The Jakarta Method. I don't know if people have read this book, but uh, the states that went furthest in trying to address the colonial structure and trying to, let's say, overcome dependency on capital in the core through things like land reform, right, through things like nationalization of resources, those states were subjected to sanctions, right? Think about the villains of the 20th century. Think about the villains of today, right? What distinguishes them from non-sanctioned states? What distinguishes Venezuela from Colombia? What distinguishes Iran from Saudi Arabia, right? What distinguishes China from India? Right? What distinguishes, uh, I might, might have already mentioned Venezuela from Colombia, but that's a, good, that's a good example, but it's just the states, again, that implemented sovereign uh, nationalization projects with the aim right, of challenging that drain of surplus from periphery to core, with the aim of reorienting resources towards national development, however problematic and limiting it ends up playing out to be. Right? Those states are subjected to sanctions across the 20th century. And the Jakarta Method is a book that is devastating, right? And if I was in the United States today, I would read that book and I would think about the question of NGOs. I would think about the question of CIA military intervention very seriously, right? Because at the time in Indonesia, they were saying, well, you're crazy to say the CIA is involved. You're denying the agency of Indonesians, right? This is not a question. What, we have nothing to do with this. In Iran, when Mossadegh was overthrown, the same thing, what? No, what, what? You're looking in the wrong place. We have nothing to do with, don't, don't look here, right? Same thing in Guatemala when our Benz is overthrown, right? The places where land is redistributed, right? An attempt for a different system uh, is, is attempted to be implemented and produced. Uh, sorry, I'm getting lost with time here. Probably have already used up my... Okay, okay. So yeah, uh, th I guess that's just the point is those states are subjected to sanction, right? States that don't undertake projects of nationalization, right? states that don't undertake projects of land reform are not subject to sanctions, but then they're only operating with a quasi sovereignty, right? Because they remain dependent upon capital from the core. They may remain dependent upon uh, foreign direct investment that then reproduces economic conditions that drain surplus from periphery to core, right? So that's the, that's the bind that third world states find themselves within. And the, so the, a key question that I haven't talked about is then in confronting this world order is challenging those states that have the capacity to level sanctions and military intervention, right? When um, projects of nationalization or say land redistribution are undertaken, right? And I will, I will maybe speak back uh, or I will link back to the first panel here, right? Hezbollah's defeat of Israel in 2006 Hezbollah's military, uh, let's say, military capacity that was demonstrated from the 1980s to 2006, right, is a fundamental moment that's actually calling into question that base material power that enforces U.S. hegemony, U.S. Israeli Saudi hegemony in the region, right? And when Tony Blair says in 2006, there's a Shia crescent, he uses this language of Shia crescent, right? This is happening right after. Right, Hezbollah and Hamas is also, there's a war in Palestine, I mean, end, endless war, right? But in 2006, there's also a confrontation uh, between uh, Palestinian armed resistance. Uh, and right, right away, you see imperialist forces panicking, right? Talking about a Shia crescent, talking about the need to target Syria, Iran uh, at that time, right? So as we think about what happened over the last 10 years, it's also important to think about it in this framework, right? What happened to Libya? Why was Libya targeted 
and not Saudi Arabia? Why was the uprising in Katif and Bahrain right, at the same time that then leftists are asked not to critique the war in Libya because why we are singling out the Americans and denying local agency. And then next thing you know is Gaddafi's being tortured to death on camera and everybody's forgotten about what happened in Katif. Right? Everybody's forgetting about Bahrain. Right? So there's a reason why Libya and Syria became the front lines of the wars in the region. Is, and that, that this should not be taken as a way then that dismisses, uh, local, like, uh, and I appreciate Nate's point, right? Dismisses the, the say the, 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 local, the more local dynamics, which are never entirely local though. That's the point we can't turn away from. Like geopolitics matter, right? And um, the, I think, so the question of, of confronting that military power remains preeminent. The question of confronting who can levy, levy sanctions remains preeminent because, and I'll, I'll end here, is the theorist who I, I take most from is Samir Amin. Okay, and Samir Amin wrote a wonderful piece before he died called The Sovereign Popular Project, where he basically is arguing that the national liberation question, and thank you to Summer, uh, uh, I was speaking to in, in, during the break, talking about national liberation as a class struggle. And Samir Amin makes this point too, national liberation as a class struggle, based on a sovereign popular project right, that is based upon empowering the peasantry, redistributing land, and nationalizing resources, but this will be undercut every step of the way by US military hegemony, right? And so that's a fundamental contradiction that must be con confronted. And it's important for the ecological future of the planet as well, right? Because absent reparations, states in the South will industrialize, right? They will seek to build up a power, right? Uh, that will have ecological consequences, right? So that the reparations question can only come from the challenge of, of US uh, imperialism. So sorry for, for going over time there. Thank you guys so much. And I, um, I, I want to just uh, give you guys a chance to uh, respond to anything that may have come up in each other's presentations um, and maybe just offer uh, one thought uh, that I was trying to hold in my head throughout each, each of the presentations. And I wonder if, if you have a response to it. Um, you know, uh, Arash opened us up thinking about a, a, a context that I, I also think about quite a lot, which is the kind of it, anti-colonial or anti-imperialist movement in a context that is not considered classically colonial, you know, semi-colonial, not colonial. I, I, I study Turkey, which is another situation where the, you know, authoritarian powers always insist, and maybe even, and not even the, only the authoritarian powers, many people insist that, you know, these things don't apply because Turkey was never, never formed the country. These, these decolonial politics don't apply because Turkey was never colonized. Try saying that to the Kurds. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is sort of, is sort of uh, where, where I sit on that. And, and, and I bring this up in thinking or, or just sort of offering to think about what is learned about decolonial movements from these kinds of specific contexts, particularly towards Arash's point about indeterminacy. You know, it, I think I think it's, it's it's maybe relevant that what he brings up about Shariati developed in this context and not necessarily somewhere else. Um, and we also might include in that, um, you know, an outcome of um, you know a, a Kurdish uh, movement that develops really alongside and almost in tandem with 1979 in Iran, that has arrived in a moment, particularly in Syria today of embracing a kind of indeterminacy away from the more sort of classically Maoist way of uh, you know, uh, advancing revolution. Something to think about um, in, in, that, in that context um, as well. So. I mean, I, I feel like you said what I said, so I don't know what I would say. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, maybe the one thing I would offer to, let's make the, the meatball even spicier, if you will. Uh, maybe the one thing I would offer is, um, there was an earlier remark in the previous panel about how we're not talking about utopianism. Um, 
And um, maybe I'll try to bring utopianism into the room with even greater force to kind of add on to that question. I, I wonder if a semi-colonial set of circumstances offer possibilities for thinking beyond what your eyes immediately do or don't see. Um, I wonder if it allows for possibilities to think beyond a positivist kind of framework. And I wonder if the debate that we're talking about, not now I'm just being provocative, but I wonder if the debate that we're talking about, the form is consistent across both sides of the debate. So people will say, we need to listen to methodological nationalism. We need to listen to people on the ground in Syria when they're demanding certain things. And I know because I, I know the facts empirically. And then the counter would be Bikram, you know, we need to pay attention to the structures of the world system. And I know because I'm understanding it empirically. And I wonder if actually utopianism, I mean, at least in the Thomas More version, it's referring to a no place, something that does not exist. Um, and is there something a, a virtuous actually <laughs> about dabbling in things that don't exist and training ourselves to see beyond what is immediately present before our eyes to actually discard a kind of positivist sensibility if we're talking about revolution and opening ourselves up to new revolutionary possibilities. This is at least what I learned from Walter Benjamin. I think that there, there maybe is a different kind of orientation that's required that recovery projects that say, this is what happened in the 1970s, capitalist world systems analysis that says, this is what the world is, or a certain kind of project that says, this is what's going on right now on the street in 2019. All of them perpetuate a way of thinking that might actually be at odds with a kind of Benjaminian analysis. I think I might have made enemies with everybody in the room. I'll be the second one and we can all fight for the next two days. Sounds fun after two years of Zoom actually. Um, so I will take up that invitation for more provocation. There's something troubling to me about the notion that if we don't problematize the United States intervention in the world, we are somehow denying agency to local actors. And I think both problematic in the way that we're thinking about agency, but also um, in terms of the fact that we're no longer in a Cold War moment. And so, you know, and, and this I think is also an environmental point. If I'm thinking about anti-fracking protests uh, in North Africa, for example, and the critiques around extractivism, which in the South was really a precursor to a lot of revolutionary activity, um, this came about uh, not because of French uh, neo-colonial interests, but because the Algerian state, which actually is a kind of sovereignist entity, um, I think, of course, we can talk about neo-colonialism, but there's also sovereignty that has been had and was had. I think we would agree that um, perhaps we wouldn't. I don't know. You know, I, I'm, I'm both sympathetic to this critique of um, think about core periphery models, but that leaves me kind of unable to account for the very radical environmental claims that have been made against a nation state which does have a form of sovereignty. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess perhaps we can start there. Uh, there's also, I think, something to, to say about um, primitive, primitive accumulation as not only a kind of model that occurred the same way everywhere, but also in terms of the capacities of different local communities um, to generate value. So, you know, the, the notion of kind of core periphery, then we have to think about, well, which, which groups of people did in this um, tradition did have the capacity to um, use land in appropriate ways? Um, I think uh, on that last, last point, um, I think the, the question of extractivism is, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make a lot of enemies in this room as well, probably, but I, I have a big problem with the word extractivism because it came up, it, it, it came to prominence um, at, at a particular moment in time when states like Venezuela were using oil rents, right? We're using oil revenues to challenge um, dependency in Latin America and to construct and build uh, national projects that could free from dependency and had real material benefits, right? And, you know, and that's where the reparation question becomes very significant, right? So Evo Morales in Bolivia put on the table, right? The, not, not just Evo Morales as an individual, but the movement towards socialism, right? This, uh, this indigenous movement that comes to state power it puts a demand for reparations in 2009, right? Massive reparations saying, look, if you don't want us to extract resources, then the global north should rep pay reparations and redistribute resources towards uh, 
because uh, poverty is not decolonization, poverty is not socialism, right? So development is something that you cannot monopolize, right? And so I think the question around then how, uh, when, when the coup happens in, uh, when, when the movement towards socialism is overthrown, right, by really reactionary forces, there is this environmental language that is deployed around what Maas was doing vis-a-vis um, -vis some forms of extraction, right? But that's a question that I think ultimately, and I guess this is where I'm stuck <laughs> at the world systems level, takes me to reparations, right? Like uh, we, we live in a massively uneven world, right? Where, where the benefits and costs of, uh, let's say the world economy are so unevenly distributed that reparations must be something that those of us who are located here, that should be our primary uh, call uh, of action on the environmental question, I would say. Yeah. Maybe. I'll just approach this from a slightly different angle. I just want to clarify that what I think is interesting about thinking about Lebanon and the international civil war that took place there, this tiny country, it was a question of sovereignty over colonialism, even though they don't have, like, Lebanon doesn't have any material resources that the empire is trying to um, you know, control materially. What it does, what the empire is trying to control there is precisely politics, geopolitics. Lebanon is important in that time because of its position on the borders of occupied Palestine and as a home for the Palestinian revolution and increasingly the Arab, the only free base of the Arab national liberation movement that was trying to, or in that re region, in the Mashrik, uh, it was an important base of, of Arab national popular, a sovereign popular project. And the sectarian regime in Lebanon is precisely about fragmenting the political subject that was designed to, uh, the state was designed to be weak. It was the French appointed the, the writers and framers of the constitution were completely beholden to them. The religious um, sectarian institutions were given power over the state and the colonial power was given power over the state as well. So the state is encumbered at every point. And the, also the Lebanese elites uh, that have ran the country uh, on this service financial capitalism model also gave sovereign power of, for instance, the banking administration and association as Hisham Safiuddin has written about in his book to um, the associations of banks is actually more sovereign than the Lebanese state. The Lebanese state doesn't have the power to audit what's going on in the banking system, for instance. And we can see what, where that has led us to today. So reframing the, the national movement um, as a sovereign popular project is exactly what I'm doing. And seeing that the, sovereign, the sovereignty question isn't just about material resources, but also about reshaping political subjectivities and political control and bringing uh, a fragmented population together uh, to have self-determination. Uh, I want to turn to the, anyone in the audience. You have a question, uh, Max? Thanks, to all of you. Um, <clears throat> there's definitely something worthwhile in this turn towards uh, a macro perspective. Bringing in a world systems theoretical framework certainly helps to nuance the conversation that we're having. I want to kind of bring it back to some of the issues that we were talking about in the first panel, which I see refracted through the comments that were offered on this one, having to do with the local and the national scale of analysis. We are still, in a sense, in all of your comments, we are still, in a sense, trying to think through what it is that even if a spectral revolutionary subject, what a revolutionary subject wants in these different world historical circumstances. And I noticed in the um, in Arash's presentation and Miriam and Nate's presentation, a kind of interesting methodological challenge that I just wanna sort of throw out and ask your, your opinions on, um, because you're each talking about a different kind of, if not revolutionary, then at least transformative subject at 
play in each of those contexts. So for to be specific about it, so for Arash, I mean, I was really taken by the point you made about the difference between a lecture and a text as it pertains to the kind of charismatic authority that is often uh, imputed to Shariati. And there's a similar dynamic at play in the history, the intellectual history of Michel Aflac, for example, who is often confused between being a theorist and a belletristic writer and a speaker or a teacher. And so I just wonder if you have any thoughts on, or if you could elaborate a little bit more fully on what it, what it means to remain focused on the charismatic authority of a figure like Shariati in the midst of a larger conversation about the anonymity of a character like Jandar, which has such a, a kind of cosmic significance to it in a sense, in, in a way that I, I hope will be clearer when I tether it to the thought about Miriam's insight about Mujahid, for example, about collective authorship. So when thinking about what kind of a subject comes into view, even if there is a role for the intellectual in the capital I sense, we've got capital R revolution, so why not some capital I intellectuals? What, what role do they have to play here. And so you're dealing with something really interestingly dynamic there with the outsized panel and then a collective subject that somehow subtends his own project. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about, and I think the, the quote you brought from a, a woman you interviewed about, you know, we are Algerian, we are not Arab, we are Arab, but this, uh, but who is the we is, is kind of the question that I'm trying to kind of wrestle with here in both of those um, moments. And um, again, this is a pretty scattered thought, but I thought I would try to, you know, run the trifecta of addressing a question to all three. And um, in, in Nate's comments, there, there's a different, I think it was the absence of your mentioning, it, the fact that you didn't say the name Kamal Jumblat forced me to think back on these other two points, the, the sense that you, you're trying to center a collective subject, one that is predicated on the activity of parties or of trade union associations or of, you know, collectivities. And so is there a place, I think, I think in a sense, one of my question is, is, is there a place for the intellectual in the history that you three are telling, the intellectual in its broadest or, you know, however you want to define intellectual, but in the broadest possible sense is how I'm thinking about it. Uh, I'll take one or two more and then we'll have around. So is it okay if we take a couple of questions together? Yeah. Yeah, this is actually kind of related to Max's question, I think, but um, I, I'm, I was just, I, I've been thinking, Fadi brought up in the first panel this question of citizenship, which I actually meant to raise in my questions and I forgot, so I'm, I'm partly cheating here, but it also, it, I kept thinking about it during these um, presentations too, this problem of citizenship and taking the national for, for granted. And, um, you know, it seems like as soon as we bring revolution and decolonization back in, <laughs> um, the, this question of the national frame um, maybe starts to be taken for granted again. This is not a critique. I work within the national frame myself, and um, you know I don't think there's any value in pretending nation states don't exist. So revolution also allows us to deal with, with the question of the state again, I think, more directly. Um, but it's different from this question of uprising and global uprising, right? So, so we've, um, what do I want to say? Just do you have comments on this problem of citizenship and the national frame? And you know, I mean, Lebanese nationalism as an example is, you know, of course, it's um, uh, it's been a really important way to be anti-sectarian, right? Which is partly in, in Nate's presentation. Um, on the other hand, we're also talking about a country where some huge percentage of the population are refugees. They're not citizens. So what does self-determination mean? And are we just back to this problem of defining the self? And maybe maybe just we've already said everything we need to say about that critique, but then we seem to be at some kind of impasse in this conversation. Thank you all for that. I mean, I, I, I think what I want to ask goes to maybe in very broad terms, the kind of tension here between structure and history, shall we say, is that's I think where I'm going to wade in. And um, so this is what I want to think about. All, all of you kind of point to uh, a certain kind of persistence or continuity in very different ways, I think, of, of the colonial, right? And not, not coloniality, but of the colonial. And if, if we agree for a minute, I don't know if we do, but if we agree for a minute that global capitalism is conditioned by the colonial question, by a colonial structure, shall we say, um, you know, what, the, part of what I wanted to get at is how do we think about that today, right? How do we think about that now, half a century after the height of the decolonization movement as this world-making project and half a century of global counter-revolution as a kind of anti-decolonization movement? How do we think about it after 
the impasses that we've all kind of grappled with, or the tragedy, if you want, of the post-colonial state, right? Um, so there is this matter of structural continuity, and there's also this matter of historical break and historical change, right? Um, and so what, what, you know, how, how do we formulate a, I don't know, it's not a theory, but it's a, it's a take on decolonization that tries to do both, right? This is one way of getting at this synthesis between the anti-authoritarian and the anti-imperial, right? There is a sense where you know, a return to the sovereignty question, a return to land reform, a return even to reparations doesn't look the same as it did 75 years ago, right? Um, so, you know, maybe that, maybe there's a question in, a, in, a, in essence as well about going back to, you know, what is the revolutionary subject of decolonization today, right? Um, in which, you know, the, 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 the it, it's, it's not quite the, the wretched, it's not, certainly not the citizen anymore, um, and maybe not the worker, maybe not even the peasants, right? So, you know, that that tension between structure, yes, I'm with you. The structure is still there. The contradiction is still there. But that history that's also happened over this last 75 years that kind of forces a rethink. Just to add to what you actually, I mean, everybody is saying, but specifically what you're saying is, especially in, in a context, I mean, you've all mentioned Fanon, and, and I'm just thinking, and I'm, I'm going to be provocative a little bit. Um, Using Fanon, for example, in Iraq is very controversial. Why? Because Saddam Hussein used to quote Fanon in his speeches, right? So we, we are in a situation where we could also kind of agree theoretically, but where we have to acknowledge the fact that the language of all of these uprisings have nothing to do with the language that, you know, have been used um, or are often used in, in the left, uh, in the left and also in the scholarship of the left. So how do we deal with that? Uh, so I, I think some of the questions are more directed for others. So I'll just work with Max's question, but I think all of them are speaking about what is a revolutionary subject and how is it imagined. I think I would contradict myself if I attempted to answer that question in an empirical fashion. Um, and so I think the erasure of the role of the intellectual, which is what is what we strive for, um, would lead us to some kind of an empirical answer here. And I think probably the more honest thing to do is to, this is going to, sorry, but to witness the intellectual under erasure in the act of. And so that's what I was interested in with Shariati um, and with his method and with what he's up to. So if we're talking about Fanon, everybody thinks that Shariati and Fanon exchanged letters. There's no proof that Shariati and Fanon ever exchanged letters. The, the alienation and freedom is a translation of a part of a, a Shariati lecture. He wrote a preface to it and he said, I had some correspondences with Fanon and this is what was said. In Islam Shanasi at another point, he, he, in, in the middle of a lecture, he says, I had some correspondences with Fanon and he says something totally different. And he says, this is what Fanon said. But Shariati is somebody who made up characters left and right. So why do we believe that when he says he corresponded with Fanon, he actually corresponded with Fanon? If you look at the French version, it says that it's taken from the text and it's translated from the Persian. It makes sense. Fanon did not write in Persian. Um, but then in the English version, that part falls off. And so everybody thinks, oh, there was a correspondence. There's no correspondence as far as I'm concerned. And I think that's actually instructive, is to think about that. Um, so what I do with Shariati, at least in the context of the Iranian revolution, is to look at how he mobilizes a discourse of shahadat. Everybody thinks that Shariati is calling for other Iranians to act, to, to die like Imam Hussein, right? To put your body out there. The fact of the matter, as Charles Kurzman shows, is that people did not do that. Instead, according to Kurzman, everybody was pragmatic. I think we can actually continue Shariati's register here, which is that Shariati says two things. He says, die like Imam Hussein or live like Zainab. And I think Iranians actually chose to live like Zainab, which looks from a Western perspective as pragmatism. But it's actually to be a witness, to get to your earlier comment, it parallels the action of a human rights observer to bear witness to the suffering that's taking place. Um, and it involves an act of receptivity, which as Rakur tells us, is the third moment in any narrative, open-ended judgment, who knows where it's gonna go indeterminacy. Uh, 
So, and it's, and it's situated. So I, I think the project here is for Shariati working through the Islamic tradition to actually erase himself as an intellectual. I think if I'm going to be consistent in how I talk about it, then I shouldn't pretend that I found the revolutionary subject. Instead, I work with these traces and I work with the limitations. Maybe I've read too much Shariati and Iqbal, but we don't touch God, we approach God, I don't know. So I have nothing about the Fenon letter and whether that's real or not. So the Fenon's response, I don't think it actually changes my argument, but I know we've had this exchange before about this, these letters. Um, I'm going to start with the question of the intellectual and who is the, intell you know, who is the intellectual that we're in this revolutionary time. And I think one of the things that's been interesting in Algeria is looking at the emergence of something like an organic intellectual that had been impossible certainly following the civil war. So Muhammad Tadajit, who was imprisoned, who has come to, known, come to be known as the poet of the Hirak, if you see him, he's neither the worker nor the peasant nor the intellectual of the university. Um, he's from Bab al-Wad, he writes in Darja, his poems have kind of gone viral. But I think that's precisely the figure that is most threatening to a regime um, that you know, has done its best to erase certain forms of the intellectual. So, you know, the, the, the Algerian intellectual who left for France during the Civil War is a very well-known trope, um, but to stay was very hard. And if I think about, you know, friends who stayed and tried to, you know, thinking about Nacht and Dahar Jarbal, for example, or, you know, the, the people who tried to create something after the Civil War and who stayed, there are structural reasons why the intellectual with the capital I was kind of rendered difficult, including journalists. Um, but, but I think one of the threatening things about the Hirak was this new form of intellectual activity. And the reason why certain NGOs, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, like the Raj were, were dissolved by the Algerian government under the pretext that they were being financed by the Americans. And you know, this is an organization that came to light after 1988 in those protests to think about waves of revolt um, and was completely shut down because allegedly um, you know, the Americans were behind it. So, you know, I think the different forms of intellectual engagement are important. Um, you know, to get to back to my point on Fanon, which I, I see has hit a nerve, um, the, the, one of the Algerian editions of Wretched of the Earth has Bouteflika writing the preface. Bouteflika allegedly knew Fanon because they were both in the war together. So um, by no means does Fanon's co-optation by lots of unsavory people in the region. Um, am I overlooking that? What I was trying to get at is a certain reading of the Algerian revolution, which I see in two directions in the 1960s and 70s. One is by a kind of secularist French radical tradition, which has its own reading of the revolution. And another is by a kind of pan-Arab mushrik, uh, you know, articles that are written coming out of, you know, back of Syria or Lebanon, for example. And so my question is, you know, how do we think about the Algerian revolution um, and decolonization when it's been wedged into these meta narratives, uh, which were not necessarily the languages that intellectuals or, um, you know, really fighters at the war at the time were writing it. And I think it's also indicative of a whole slew of works that have said, you know, the FLN didn't have intellectuals, they were method men, right? There's been a number of works that, that have said that this is just praxis. Um, and so how do we think about intellectual activity, both in these moments of extreme engagement, including Fanon himself, um, and how those have been used for different purposes. And, you know, along with the co-optation of Fanon by the regime has come a rediscovery of Fanon by Algerian journalists and a new generation who is on different, you know, um, pancarts, um, different signs, uh, alongside people like Malik Ben Nabi, which is an interesting ideological juxtaposition. But again, you know, the question of where are the intellectuals in the Algerian case, and I know people here have written about this in, in terms of the Arab uprisings um, in the Mushrik, is also a structural one tied to civil war. And why, you know, why Fanon and Malik Ben Nabi right now, I think is an interesting question. And does it mean the same thing it meant in 1975 you know, or something? Um, I think uh, Fanon for me is correct and uh, Kwame and Kumar are correct. And just in the sense that theory, history, structure, history, there, there was discussion around the return, but the, 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 it depends on how we look at history. Right? It depends on what we see and don't see. And being in the imperial core right now as academics is very easy. The easy thing for us to do is to look past US imperialism, look past the way that the history of the last seven decades 
there's been um, like Cuba is still under sanctions. Okay, well, how has history changed the Democratic People's Republic of Korea being totally excluded from the global economy? And this is a state that was subject to genocidal violence by this state, right? There's been a movement in the last 10 years about decoloniality, of epistemology and ontology. No language, there's absolutely no language we possess to actually call for a redrawing of the relationship with North Korea, right? When Trump tries to talk to them, he, the, the left critiques him, right, on this question. So the last 70 years, the history, the sanctions regime has persisted, right? Um, you read Fanon's writing on Lumumba, right? It's prophetic and it is clear, right, that Lumumba in Congo was going to nationalize resources. There's a secessionist insurgency that is sponsored by the West, by Belgium and the Americans, right? And what Mobutu comes into power for decades, that's history too. Right? That's also the history we must grapple with, right? Is that the fact is that the betrayal in the post-colonial era cannot only be understood as an internal betrayal, right? Uh, authoritarianism was a term that was also devised by the Mont Pelerin society, right? The neoliberals, Hayek and them, authoritarianism was also an anti-communist, anti-third worldist term that they used. And often, I like to say it often signifies not only, okay, don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say only, but it often is deployed against those states that did establish authority over, let's say, transnational capital in particular ways, right? Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a history also that has been reproduced, right? And, 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 I, and I come back to Democratic People's Republic of Korea constantly because this is a population that was 20% was murdered by this state, right? How are we grappling with that history today, right? Why do we have no language as a left to talk about sanctions against Venezuela and what it does to people's access to medicine, right? That's a history. Why is Venezuela, we must ask that question. Why are they under sanctions and why do we not have a language to oppose it? I, I, I ask that to the entire room when the rising language is more so well, things are complicated more, uh, maybe not US imperialism, X, Y, Z, that takes our attention away from, right? How we are material, materially located in the world economy. If we're actually committed to decolonization, it's very clear. Uh, how our analysis and action should be trained, right? I think that's, that's maybe one way I would answer that question. Like, I mean, and look at Cuba. What was Cuba's sin, right? They, they conducted land reform and nationalization and they're under sanctions for that reason till this day, right? And I'll just, the last point I'll make around the revolutionary subject. Um, for Fanon, the revolutionary subject was the fella, right, was the peasant. The, um, and and I, I, to, to me, to till this day, this is a, not the only, but this is a primary revolutionary subject. Okay, so I wrote about last year about the India farmers protests, right? So this, these are peasant farmers who rose up, right? And they were contesting a world trade organization regime that has been attacking peasants in the South uh, for decades now, right? So the, the revolutionary subject, and this is, this is an means point, by going to the peasant, you go away from the comprador elite, right? So the third world state that doesn't say, uh, address the global colonial structure is reproduces a peripheral structure of a comprador elite that benefits, right? And, um, and the masses that don't, right? And that's where Amin argues for the need for land reform to broaden. So the form of sovereignty matters, right? The sovereign, the class basis of sovereignty. Is it based upon a broadly, uh, a, a, a system that distributes assets broadly through land reform, right? That can structure a different ecological and social system, right? that then prevents that drain. But then, as Nkrumah says, the neocolonialists will return, right? So I think, yeah, history has moved, but in many ways, we're still stuck <laughs> with the, that sanctions regime of the last several decades. Thank you. Um, I'll start by addressing Max's question about the absence of Kamal Jumblat. This is a, I'm so happy you asked me because <laughs> Usually I just talk about Kamal Jumblad and everybody's sick of it. So this time <laughs> I, well, it's important to discuss the problem of leadership, right? In revolutions, the intellectual and the relationship between the intellectual and masses and the political um, leader, the political leaders as well. And, and in my dissertation, uh, excuse me, book project, <laughs> postdoc, excuse me, um, 
I deal with this question extensively, the intellectual, and I, and one of the mo most annoying things about the historiography of the Lebanese civil war is the absence of agency uh, or accountability for specific people doing specific things, who did what is kind of a basic question. And then that gets in, uh, sidelined and the contemporary discourse about the war in Lebanon becomes uh, especially in Lebanon becomes it's so complicated we can't understand it or it's a black hole of them we can't possibly sort it out it's so complicated but in fact we need to go back and look at what individuals said and did and advocated and use their language to recover yes their agency but of course within the structure of unequal um, capitalist imperialism and the role of Kamal Jambla is really, really interesting. And he's super controversial, even amongst people who you would think might like him on the left or something like that. Um, the best way for me to illustrate this is I interviewed um, a, two uh, very old Lebanese communists uh, in the south of Lebanon that participated uh, as comrades. They're, they're in their 80s now. They still hang out every day. They were, you know, fighting with, um, they participated in armed struggle and all that. And the political organization of, of trade unions and, and uh, socialism in Lebanon. These two comrades, when I asked, well, what do you think about the role of Kamal Jambla? One said, this guy, there's nothing revolutionary about him. He's a feudalistic, he's a political feudalist that destroyed everything about the revolution in Lebanon. His friend right next to him said, when Kamal Jamblat was alive, the Lebanese left was strong. And after he died, we fell apart. I think I tend to take the latter view in, the, uh, in this equation and that it's not so simple as he was a Yes, he was one of the most aristocratic members of, uh, of the political elite in Lebanon, but he advocated policies that were destroying or were targeted on destroying the, um, the ol oligarchy in Lebanon. Then you, some other people say, well, he's just trying to grab power for himself because he could do that. Well, politician that doesn't seek power or revolutionary that doesn't seek to institutionalize political power or, what, or any politician, what is that? So the debate goes on, and I hope I can contribute to that um, in my work. And on the other hand, I look at the, the intellectuals and mobilizers of the counter-revolution and what they actually said and did. And I look a lot of, about Charles Malik on that, which we can talk about at a different time, which gets us into the question of citizenship that um, uh, Sarah raised. When I go back to the, the sources of the newspapers of the time to see the political debate of the time. They, the national movement parties really conceived their struggle as one of establishing citizenship, but citizenship, they, you know, there's a great quote. So actually Lebanon is usually seen as a very liberal regime that um, uh, there's freedom of the press and political organization. Well, that's not true exactly. All non-Lebanese political parties were illegal, actually, until Kamal Jamblat um, legalized them when he was the Minister of Interior. On the base, and those parties were illegal because of the, yes, they're considered imported ideas. So the Ba'ath Party, the Communist Party, the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, uh, Anything that was not Lebanese nationalist was actually illegal. And at a rally where they, and after those regimes were, after those parties were legalized, the right wing wanted to re um, make, to re proscribe them, remake them illegal again. Uh, and, you know, people got up at the rally and say, this is the, this regime, the sectarian regime is incapable of producing one citizen in this country, we're only members of sex, basically. So, and at the same time, this, the notion of citizenship that they were um, advocating was not this NGO depoliticized, make claims upon um, local, the local um, 
politics of the country, but they were trying to transform and make the liberation and active popular sovereignty in the entire region um, by taking up the anti-colonial struggle, by calling for the arming of, of, of the population of the South to defend against Israeli incursions. This is a different kind of citizenship than um, what people are talking about today. I think I'll I'll leave it at that for now. We have time for one very quick round of questions. So, um, so I I'm kind of curious because to me, um, we're living today on the cusp of a very different world. Um, as you can hear from my previous question about surveillance, um, the announcement that Amazon is sending new satellites into space, um, I think, is a major change in global power structures and that there are new forms of colonialism that are emerging that are going beyond planet earth now not to sound very bombastic but it has huge implications on power structures and on that question of sovereignty right because sovereignty i mean is jeff bezos a sovereign so to speak i'm being a provocateur mm -hmm. but it changes how we need to think about revolutions, counter-revolutions, what does decolonization mean in this day and age? Um, thanks. This is a sort of narrow question for, uh, or empirical question for Nate. Um, so I know that some of the participants in the Lebanese national movement would have had their own anti-colonial uh, critiques, persistent ones, especially groups like the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. I know that Kamal Jumblat at certain points made sort of dependency theory arguments about Lebanon capturing wealth from flows of oil and capital from, from the Gulf. Um, but during the 1975-76 period specifically, um, what, like in what ways did the participants in the Lebanese national movement connect the struggle against political sectarianism to colonialism? Um, is this an analytic that you're deploying, um, that you're making the bridge between uh, French colonialism and post-coloniality and sectarianism, political sectarianism? Or were um, members of the Lebanese national movement actually explicitly tying their political struggle to, for example, simultaneous political struggles in Palestine against Zionism, in Vietnam against American imperialism, et cetera? Do you want to take that quickly and then we'll we'll break? Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly respond to the first question on Jeff Bezos and satellites. And I know your first question, the first panel was around surveillance. And it's quite interesting, like a uh, 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 developing area of my own research is on the intersection of data and finance. But I'm, I'm thinking about it in relation to these questions around sovereignty and so forth. So first quick point though, I would say, yeah, Jeff Bezos is a sovereign, right? That's the, that's the whole thing about a capitalist state. I mean, Marx's point about the committee of the bourgeoisie but look, like you vote in Biden, you vote in whoever, and there's certain things that just don't change, right? There's certain interests that cannot be breached in US context. And I, I was at a talk last night by Cornell West and he was talking about the decrepit political system of the United States, right? And it's decrepit because you cannot ask questions on who is the actual sovereign. So it's not a new thing that Bezos would be the sovereign or finance capital is a sovereign. Um, and, but it's quite interesting around the development of data, around the development of say, uh, collecting information the way you're implying, like uh, China very recently declared data a fourth factor of production, right? That was, it was quite a interesting move they made two years ago. In addition to land, labor, capital, they declared data for the purposes to ensure that data is mobilized, not for narrow profit purposes, but for developmental purposes, right? And so there was a, and you, there's been a series of regulations that you know the Western media has been just uh, really taken aback by <laughs> the crackdowns in China that have happened over the past year on this sector. But the one thing I will say is that it doesn't it doesn't it, it eject itself from history though. The emergence of data and data driven economies and the desire for information comes out of the very systems we're talking about today, right? So finance capital, like I, when I started looking into this, I was like, why do they keep like with our phones like you were saying right like okay is this so they can market things better to us is that really it like you, you want our information so you can figure out how to sell things but um as i've been looking into it it seems like one there's a major intersection between uh data the data economy and financial speculation right 
is that the inability of capital to deploy its surpluses for socially useful goods, you know, leads it to things like stock derivatives, but it's also a major force, I think, driving the data revolution, right, is, is a way to accumulate without going through the formal economy, which can't, labor can't make a claim to it. But there are implications for imperialism, right? So I won't get into detail on it, but I've written a paper on the role this played in the India farm laws, right? That this was actually an attempt to grab the data of farmers in the global south in order to allow global agricultural companies to engage in financial speculation of commodities uh, across, across the world, right? That doesn't mean data is a bad thing, but the question is who is sovereign on the data question? Okay. So, uh, I think Nate had a specific question and then I think we're, we're at time, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, that's a great question. Is it a framework that I impose or do the members of the national movement talk about it themselves? They, uh, it's, uh, they talk about it themselves. Um, they, they struggle against colonialism. They, the, one of the main goals of, and that, this is what I, I forgot to address the question of non-citizens, which actually can be related to here. So they really struggled for what was one of the main political aims of the period before the Civil War and of the, during the Civil War was a struggle for fusion iltiham with the Palestinian movement and the creation of a Lebanese popular resistance that would fight and be, um, that would be accountable to itself and control development in the South and fight against Zionist settler colonialism as well. Um, yet yeah, that's a very explicit um, the question of non-citizens is very interesting because yeah, the alliance between the national movement and the Palestinian revolution was explicitly the defense for the Lebanese national movement was the defense of the non-citizen against the counter-revolutionary fascist genocidal violence that was being unleashed upon them in terms of um, you know, entire refugee camps were targeted for expulsion and destruction at the very beginning of the war by, by the right wing. Uh, it wasn't just the left that was, oftentimes the left gets blamed for the civil war, basically the burden of the, of the civil war uh, is placed upon the left for daring to transform, want to transform the system. This view totally neglects the very open literature of the Lebanese counter-revolutionary forces who are talking about um, ex wholesale extermination or, or, the, um, or the removal of the Palestinian population for years before the, the, the war um, started. They were they, the counter-revolutionary discourse racialized the Palestinian as a um, communist threat, potential communist threat, uh, sowing Maoist, uh, they, they couldn't decide whether they're proletarians or peasants, basically, that were either way, they were just a menace to society, basically. Uh, and the national movement, uh, you have these two opposing views of citizenship and authenticity in reflected in the revolutionary and counter-revolutionary alliances that are perfectly symmetrical uh, and polar opposites between Kamal Jumblat's very eclectic uh, let's grab influences and look to the global south for inspiration in India uh, and, and his connections with Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, North Korea. Uh, you know, people say, well, he was al allied with Sadat at the end of his life or something, but he was also allied with the rejection front too. So it was like, you can't really, these things have to be balanced and looked at it. So there was a, he actually advocated for the creation of a Palestinian Ministry of Palestinian Affairs, them being the largest um, refugee non-citizen population in the country. So incorporating non-citizen in the governance of Lebanon without making them citizens, same time preserving the struggle for Palestine was something that they thought of very explicitly and redesigning the uh, the unbridled laissez-faire capitalist system as well was being pointed toward. Go, go ahead, Arash. So um, I actually think uh, it, the peasant is not the revolutionary subject in Fanon. I think to read it in that way is to miss 
it's le damne, it's the wretched. And I think to read it in that way is to miss his method, which is dialectical. The text is moving. And I think that answers the question about outer space. And maybe I'm in outer space, but I think, <laughs> I, I think circumstances change. And I think the call in Fanon or Shariati, it's interesting to me is to call upon us to also engage in that mode of thinking that is becoming, that is alive. And so I think that there's different kinds of recovery projects. One is we go back to history to find the answer. I think there's another where we go back and we think about things in a different way and we look at form. I think if we say that this is what Fanon said and this is what we must do, then yes, yeah, Saddam Hussein will take Fanon and like you, you've already relinquished, right? The possibility of taking the text in a different way. I think it's incumbent upon us to pay attention to method and form for these reasons. But sorry, I had to get that off. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. It's so great not to be in outer space and to be here with you all. I want to please join me in thanking our, our panel. Um,